Hi, my name is Malcolm Clemens Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral and welcome to the forum. Each year, Grace Cathedral chooses a theme for reflection. And in 2023, our theme is healing. It's the year of healing in every respect, um, physically, emotionally, spiritually. As we approach the 10th anniversary of Occupy Wall Street though, inequality continues to be on the rise. What is philanthropy's role or what should it be to help heal our divided country? Tonight, we have the great opportunity to hear from Hillary Pennington. Hillary is Executive Vice President for Program at the Ford Foundation, whose mission is to reduce poverty and injustice, strengthen democratic values, promote international co cooperation, and advance human achievement which I might say, mention, we need to all of those things, especially this, these days. She also oversees the BUILD program, which aims to strengthen social justice organizations, reducing inequality in all its forms. Hillary, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know it's late over there. We're so grateful that you um, made time in your schedule for us here on the West Coast. Oh, it's a great pleasure to be with you, Malcolm. I was thinking so much about you during this um, presidential transition um, as uh, Joe Biden comes into the into the White House. And I, I, I think in my lifetime, there probably hasn't been as much attention to the, just the presidential transition. We always hear um, news reports, read news articles about that process, but there was a lot more attention to the, tra the tr transition this year. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what it looked like to you as someone who is part of the transition team for Bill Clinton. Well, I mean, just like everything that happened this year, it was surreal watching it from the outside. And yet, I think, you know, the transition team seems to have done a really great job. It, it, I think it was much harder for them to do some of the things that transition teams ordinarily do, which is really get inside the agencies and understand from the people that they're taking over from uh, what the key initiatives are, um, how those agencies work. But, you know, um, in my experience, one of the great things about a transition team is all the conversations that happen between and among the people working on it, where you begin to really think about and sketch out the big ideas that often then move forward in the first hundred days of an administration. And you can really see the ways in which this team took advantage of doing that kind of thinking and that kind of planning to turn the page as dramatically as they have. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of, um, we used to have like a, at the end of the football game, you'd call the special offense and it was just, there'd be like five plays. You knew exactly which one was next. You didn't need to go into a huddle or anything. Reminds me a little bit of that, but I wonder if you can tell us just some of your memories of those days. Like, you know, what is it like being part of the transition team? And, and I mean, what do you remember about it? What are the pictures in, in, that are still lingering in your mind? Well, you know, I'll tell you a story, which is really more has to do with who I was at the time than the, the transition team. But I was um, in my 30s and I was running a nonprofit organization called Jobs for the Future. And we had done a lot of work with Bill Clinton in Arkansas, um, working on economic development, uh, but also trying to design a, a youth apprenticeship program, something that would be very much in need in the United States now, really trying to figure out a more dignified way for people who didn't choose to or want to go to a four-year college to make their way um, into adulthood and into good paying jobs. And the I was assigned to a trans transition team where everyone else was, was white, was male, and was 20 or 30 years older than me and had served in the Carter administration. And they were on memory lane. And even though I was the only one of us who um, you know, was kind of in the trenches doing uh, doing work you know, in that moment, it was hard to find my own voice. It was hard to be listened to. And there came a moment when uh, Jean Sperling who worked in the domestic policy shop, um, Clinton did a summit down in Little Rock, Arkansas. And they asked me to come speak about the youth apprenticeship work. So I got on a plane, left the transition team in DC, flew down to Little Rock, did my spiel. And when I came back literally a day later, the whole weird dynamic of Washington DC had kicked in because I did a good job and Clinton called out um, the work and relationship we had. And suddenly everyone was listening to me. And it was, you know, you don't often get an experience in your life where you realize how ridiculous um, what counts for stature and status um, really, really is. Uh, and, and so that is actually one of my dominant memories of that transition team was just yeah, that it's... odd transformation. Right. It reminds me, I, I mean, I just, I remember, um, well, first of all, I was the youngest priest in the diocese for like, seemed like forever. It must've been like six years. 
Um, but then I also looked really young. Mm -hmm. um, but at least I eventually started looking older. Whereas, um, you know, I'm, I've always been male. I, I, the, the, the gender issue just seems like such an important part of that story. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've just been thinking so much, uh, you know, with, with the um, last inauguration when Donald Trump was inaugurated as president, we had those massive women's marches you know, across the country that were repeating. I mean, and I, we had um, congregants who were very disappointed they couldn't march this year. I just said, listen, it's COVID. It's not safe to have big marches like that. Um, but maybe you can talk a little bit about just where you see us going in terms of gender equality. You know, I remember in the 70s that the Equal Rights Amendment was had so much energy. And I, I, I've been hearing people talking about it more than I have um, before. And I wonder if you can just talk about just gender equality in, in the country and, and how you're perceiving where we're making progress and, and where we're just kind of stuck. Yeah, well, I think we have a long way to go, really. I mean, we've, we've come a long way, obviously. But COVID br really brings that into stark relief. You know, you look at the people that are really struggling the most and also the women that are the essential, the people that are the essential workers, and they are overwhelmingly women. Um, you know, so, and the people who have lost their jobs in this, uh, in, in this downturn are overwhelmingly women, as are the people that are taking on the second job of teaching their children at home and, and, um, and taking care of their families. So I think, you know, we, we still have individual successes and we have too little of a social, of a social structure that supports, um, quote unquote, women's work and, and women and families. Uh, you look at what's happening with, you know, our, our schooling during this period of time, uh, the lack of paid leave for families. Um, you know, so I think I, I, I was hopeful in the beginning days of the pandemic when all of those things were just so visible that this would be a time when we really, we, we rallied together around um, meeting our common and our shared needs. But, you know, that looks difficult and very politicized now. So I, I would say that, you know, I see women leaders really at the forefront of, of many of the most exciting movements for social justice happening here in this country and around the world. If you look at movements for workers' rights, um, racial justice, the Me Too movement. So I think it is a time when we have a leaderful movement, uh, very racially diverse in a way that is so important for our country's future. And with young women in particular, really insisting on a different, they don't wanna go back to normal. Normal was never good. And I, I, I take a lot of hope from that. Yeah. What about Kamala Harris? I mean, have you been paying much attention to her, um, her, her career, and and uh, you know, what kind of hope do you think um, we should have in her um, being able to draw our attention to these issues and really make um, make meaningful change? Well, I think it's it's not it's not all up to her. Um, I think people, you know, put an enormous. She she is obviously in substantively in reality an enormously important figure, the highest ranking elected woman ever in our country's history. Um, and she also can't do it all, uh, do it all herself. So I hope we will um, not make the mistake of turning her into sort of an icon and expecting un, um, unrealistic things for her, from her. But I think she is enormously capable and accomplished. She has an incredible career, which you and your your congregation in California probably know uh, much more in detail than I, but I think that she will be a really important substantive leader. I hope Biden will give her, you know, kind of her own lane and some important kinds of assignments that she can take and lead. And I'm really excited to see um, to see what she does and what they do together. Yeah, yeah, it definitely seems like a time of hope. I think in a lot of different ways. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the Ford Foundation. You know, I was um, I, I was a student at Harvard Divinity School, and I think Connie Buchanan went to the, the Ford Foundation. Is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, she's my main association with the Ford Foundation. And so all her virtues and all her gifts, I just associate them with Ford Foundation. But maybe you can tell us a little bit about how it came into being and then just you know, um, how it's evolved over time and then maybe some of the um, main focus of, of, of the foundation these days. Well, those, those years uh, of Connie were actually really glory days um, in the history of the Ford Foundation. It was a time when we um, funded really the, the creation of many, many different kinds of fields. So a feminist religious studies kind of field, a lot of work on, on area studies, women's studies, um, African-American studies, 
you know, the foundation really set up an infrastructure for knowledge generation that continues um, obviously on to this day in American universities. But Ford was founded after the Cold War um, by Henry Ford of the Ford Motor Company with a gift of stock um, from that company. And he was visionary from the beginning because he wanted it to be an institution that took on the big challenges of an emerging global order, you know, a new global order, as you read when out when you read our mission statement. And very quickly, they moved the foundation from Detroit to New York City. They created an independent board. Um, they did not mean it to be, you know, part of the company or part of the family. And those were really important pieces of the of the foundation's legacy. We are 80 years old now in a rapidly changing landscape um, of philanthropy. You know, so a lot of the new um, wealth that's come into the sector in recent years and the past several decades since the Gates Foundation um, got founded, you know, has the ability to do things differently and also learn from, you know, the legacies of foundations like ours or Rockefeller or Carnegie. Um, and I would say that uh, there's, a, there's an enormous benefit to being in a place that has worked on hard issues for a long period of time. You know, when I came to Ford with Darren Walker, who's our president now, which was in 2013, we took a step back and we looked at, you know, what did we feel we were doing well as an institution? And you look at all the big issues that we had worked on through our history, and you could not say we had solved any of them, you know, poverty, assets, women's rights. Uh, but what we, we realized is that when you work on social justice issues, you're working on issues that have to do with the structures of power in society. And for almost every win that we have celebrated in our history, working against apartheid in South Africa, women, you know, supporting the civil rights and women's movement, when, it, when there's a win, um, there's a pushback against that win. And that's why um, being able to stay in with issues for the long haul and to be able to support ideas and individuals in addition to models and services is a really, really important um, way to advance social change and social justice. So we, in that period of time, decided that there was really one issue that was the central issue for this time, and that was the issue of inequality. And we wanted to think about um, really the political and economic and cultural things that, that cause inequality to keep um, recreating itself um, in our world and in our societies. So political systems that don't give people um, adequate participation in the decisions that matter in their lives, economic systems that feel rigged to people and unjust and unfair, and, um, and then cultural norms that normalize um, discrimination, misogyny, racism. Um, you know, how do you work over time to try to change those things? And that is our solitary focus now because we, we really believe, and there's a lot of research and data that would support this, that um, societies that are more equal um, have stronger economies, have stronger social trust. We're seeing how important that is in the time of COVID. So that's really um, the essential work of the foundation today. Yeah, I, I remember reading Thomas Piketty's book, Capital, and it, it was it had a profound impact on me. I, I, I was surprised. I mean, I, I bought it at Costco and I just started reading. I just couldn't put it down. I, for you know, a few days straight in the summer, I just re that's all I did. But anyway, so reading um, Thomas um, Piketty's Capital, and and just realizing just how much like the income tax system, what a what a massive effect that has. Yeah. Um, so so how do you how do you kind of balance like how much energy you put into just like talking about the like boring things like income tax um, versus you know things like cultural uh, um, differences where which are kind of ingrained in 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 our in in, in our society. Well, we're a big foundation and we're lucky um, to be able to do more than one thing. So we have a, a, uh, a set of program areas that we focus on. And um, we have a strong belief right now that uh, one of the most important things to, have to help change happen is really to fund um, social movements, movements led by people and communities that are closest to the issues that are uh, and to the solutions. Um, that are needed in the world today. So many years ago, in fact, in Connie Buchanan's time, you know, we funded a lot of research universities and a lot of field building. And now I would say we, um, we are doing much more funding of social justice movements. 
Um, we are also funding, um, you know, we, we are looking at long standing um, issues that have a big impact on inequality, violence against women and girls being an example of that. Um, we're working to try to stop the shrinking space for civil society. So on things like free and fair elections here in the United States, but in other parts of, of the world where we have offices on issues like corruption and impunity. Uh, and then we are, we do have a very strong focus on the arts and, and creativity. We believe really, really strongly that that is one way that you help build empathy and um, you help people cross divides. And then we have a new um, program area that is looking actually at technology and society and the growth of misinformation, um, in, uh, all the kinds of algorithms that are being used, the ways in which, um, you know, the big companies are taking data and information about us and using it um, for purposes that none of us have ever agreed to. Right, right. It basically pays to, to disseminate disinformation because it's more shocking and uh, more people will read it and, um, and you'll sell more advertising. I mean, it's, just, it's a terrible thing. I'm, I'm glad you're working on it. Um, here in Silicon Valley, we, uh, every we don't we're not having too many dinner conversations these days. Or, or, or but when I do see people out in the world and we're socially distanced and I'm on a walk, that's that's the sort of thing we're talking a lot about these days for sure. You know, um, one of the things that I, I, I think just a lot about is just um, the Occupy movement, um, Occupy Wall Street, and just kind of what like lasting effect it's having on us and and how it's kind of changed people's orientation to the world and um I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that it's just it was like a it's, it's like you say it's a very practical movement that um raises people's attention to inequality well it was it was that it didn't you know it didn't get as far as as i think the people who were the organizers of it wanted it to but it, it put ideas and concepts out there in the world like the what the idea of the one percent that have proved really, really robust. And, you know, I think what we saw happen in the stock, stock markets last week, um, just the rage of, against, you know, uh, established institutions, yeah. revolt against the elites, um, the feeling that the system is rigged, you know, um, we, that we are seeing, you know, kind of the next, the next iterations of what started with Occupy Wall Street. But I would say that in a quiet way since that time, there have been a number of groups that have honed their um, kind of political economic um, thinking about really what one does to structure economies so that they are more fair. How do you really you know, rethink capitalism to have something that could be an inclusive capitalism that won't implode because of the degrees of inequality um, associated with it? And there are now Heather Boucher, who's just gone into um, the into the Biden administration, is a good example where she was a young upstart scholar and she created something called the you know, Center for Sustainable Economies and, um, and put together a network of, of graduate students and young economists across the country who are rethinking economic models and challenging you know, some of the old um, you know, kind of restore, uh, ways of thinking. And then similarly, um, you know, activists networking with each other and beginning to really have the discipline of, of sharing, you know, messages and information and coordinating together better and translating that into political action and political power. So a lot of the um, groups we saw working in Georgia and in other places around the country during the election, um, you know, kind of grew, grew out of some of the relationships that started during the Occupy um, time. So I think, you know, social justice takes a long time, a long time to happen with, um, you know, usually we think 20, you know, in kind of 20 year um, time arcs between when an idea gets started and when it's really changing things on a large scale. So I think we're still in the middle of that story. Yeah, yeah, we're in the middle of a lot of stories. I, 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 and you know, the older I get, the more I just see how how profound things have changed. And economics is a great example. I mean, you know, the way it was taught to me is just entirely it's entirely different than what we know now. Mm -hmm. um, and it just those days seem so naive. Like the models that we used, our understanding of human anthropology, um, how firms behave, even just like abilities to just use massive modeling. I mean. Um, yeah. it, it's the field has changed profoundly, and I'm I'm glad that um, young scholars are taking up those questions of inequality because they do have profound impact on you know whether people feel like they have a share in the society. Yeah. I, I love the way that you talk about um, just kind of like misinformation, the way it kind of 
disinformation can kind of um, set us at, at odds with one another. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about just about how philanthropy um, actually kind of brings people together, it, how it heals divides um, between you know, people in different classes. Well, you know, I think philanthropy doesn't automatically do that. You know, it is part of a, of a you know, like the church, you know, it, it um, so much depends on the, on the values it sets. But I think, you know, some of the things that philanthropy can do uh, is to try to, to, you know, again, fund people to do the kind of thinking around the corner that is hard to do when you're in an elected office or you're in the private sector. And, um, and I think that the divisions that we have are deep and profound. And, you know, so much of what we, we all understand about how you bridge division is by, by intimate, you know, personal relationships that help people get to know each other as human beings. You know, there's a beautiful body of research about um, how best to set up constructive conversations between people who hold different, really sharply diverse um, political views. And if you prime the conversation to get them to start talking with each other about a shared human experience, the loss of a child, you know, an experience of joy, and then you move into the more um, divisive things. They they have an ability to hold it because you've activated what they have in common. So, you know, I think one question many of us in philanthropy are asking ourselves is, how do we help support more of that? And then, how do you scale that? You know, how do you um, how do you help get from the sum to the many um, in circumstances like that? Um, you know, another area that many of us are, are paying a lot of attention to is the very, very local level where people tend to be pragmatic. You know, they can come together around the need of a, for a library or fixing their street lights, um, and they're, they're better able to solve problems. You know, I think what was the old saying that um, all politics is local? You know, yeah, and, yeah. And now, um, I think all politics, the national is polluting um, the local, and we have to figure out how to how to redress that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing. I mean, there's a way in which people care about the national more than they have in any stage of my life. It's mm -hmm. even though it's not like the stakes are any higher than they were during the Iraq war, um, there, it, it, technology makes it possible for us to, to, to have a kind of a feeling of closeness to that national political life. And yet it's an illusion because we, we can't really influence it very much. So it well, is, it's, you have to ask, you know, whether you can have a democracy when people get their in when they don't get believe in the same reality. Yeah, yeah. And how do you, you know? So I think this does come back to um, how do we manage? So how do we set the rules for what we want technology to do for us, rather than the other way around? And and that is that is a kind of thing philanthropy can be helpful in doing. You know, we ask ourselves. We have a program of work called the Future of Workers, and it's not called the Future of Work. Um, because we feel that societies decide, um, you know, we make decisions about what kind of society we want to have and what kind of technology um, we want um, to be adopting. And we should be we should be choosing to design things that put people and workers at the center. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think there this is this is, again, one of the places where I find young people to be so. Um, so much more. Uh, ahead of where many of, of of the rest of us are, you know, they they really would rather talk about human flourishing and how do you measure that and and advance that that than the GDP. Yeah, yeah. You know, they want to and they want a vision of collective um, a, a collective society, not an individualistic one. And we see this also just in the leadership of the kinds of or organizations that we fund. You know, over and over again, um, young people are deciding that they want to co-lead the organizations. Oh, they right. want leader full um, movements. And I think that that's very hopeful, but it requires established institutions like ours and probably yours to change along with them. You know, how yeah. do you get a grant to something that wants to be a network and never wants to make itself a formal organization? We have to figure mm -hmm. out how to do that. Right, exactly, because the, 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 the whole governance structure is going to be different. I do think that we're in such an early stage of these technologies that we just, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't set up very good rules about them. We're, I think we're going to look back in another generation and just be appalled at just how, how we use these technologies, that, that, that things are basically published without anybody being responsible for them. Um, it's like that, that just doesn't hasn't existed in human history, and it it and it it I don't know it, it doesn't seem like it should exist. No. But anyway, 
Yeah, yeah. I, you, you, you guys are studying it. I, I'm glad that, that it's on your radar because I think it's very important. Yeah. No, I, I think it is. It is. And um, and again, you know, I think that we people are asleep. And hopefully one of the one of the you know benefits of the horrible things our country has just gone through and is still in will be to begin to wake up and to realize what's you know what's happening um, around us with these technologies. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, one thing that we're seeing a lot just it, it, that the technologies that we have kind of raises to our attention is just um, you know very virulent um, versions of white supremacy that we just see you know, right on the front page day after day after day. But I wonder if you can just talk about just kind of like white supremacy and just kind of like the world of philanthropy, because I, you know, I know it's something that you must have thought about. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, what you have to say about that, that element of, of philanthropy. Well, philanthropy is um, a creature of inequality. That's why we have the money that we have. Um, and, you know, Edgar Villanueva wrote a wonderful book called Decolonizing Wealth, which is a yeah strong critique of philanthropy um, and a beautiful one in many ways because he talks about uh, all of the, you know, there's a very, very uneven power dynamic between a foundation that gets to decide and the people who come to the foundation seeking resources. And it very often privileges people who have privilege already. So we at Ford, for example, because we're very focused on um, issues of race and, um, and racism have just made the decision that um, until we decide just to start supporting organizations that are led by people of color. It doesn't mean other organizations aren't also good or equally deserving, but we have made an affirmative choice to really try to put our resources behind under-resourced leaders, generally leaders of color. You know, they organizations run by them receive less than 7% of all philanthropic dollars um, in the country. So the inequities just compound themselves and you have to, Find a time where you decide you're just going to, you know, you're going to stop. You're going to, you're going to figure out how to help those organizations get stronger, and that is actually part of what our build program is about. You know, giving um, five-year general support um, to organizations like that to help make them stronger and more sustainable and more durable. But I think you know a lot of leaders of those organizations um, are tired, and you know they come to the work because they have had an experience of injustice. It's racial injustice or any other kind. And we ask them to do really hard work and we don't, um, foundations generally don't fund them in ways that make their, their, their organization strong. So, you know, COVID has been an enormous wake up call for philanthropy. We've had to ask ourselves, you know, can't we figure out how to get, how to approve a grant faster? You know, can't we figure out how to fund more organizations that are closer to the, the communities that we um, are trying to serve. Why do we have to give them one-year project grants and think that and tell them that they can't spend their money on overhead and think you know they're going to be able to solve the world's greatest and hardest problems? So um, there's a lot of work for philanthropy. To yeah, do. you know it's interesting. I, I, we one of our trustees is a friend of mine. Um, he's a part of our yoga community. A wonderful person, and his name is Stuart Burden. And he's, he works in the world of philanthropy. And he was just saying that just things are happening in a lot more expeditiously than they did before. Like before COVID, there'd just be a lot more kind of like hurdles and hoops that you had to jump through. And, and I was wondering if that was something that you're seeing also or and it just what other, other things that are different in COVID in philanthropy? Yeah, well, one, yes, I am seeing a lot of that. And uh, actually there are, there's a group of practices that, um, Ford and others um, tried to put together, and we um, we we asked foundations to make a pledge to adopt those practices in this time. Just be much more flexible about their um, their funding. Uh, let grantees tell them if they need extensions. Make the grants quicker. Uh, and it's a pledge that is on the Council on Foundations website. And over 800 foundations have signed on to that pledge, wow. and are actually you know changing their practices. And I think the question is what you you and your friend have asked, which is why can't we keep doing that after COVID? And, and yeah. will we be willing um, to keep doing it after COVID? And I think that's, that's the important question. Yeah, we, were, we talk about that so much at Grace Cathedral, just, um, you know, what's going to be next? Because it will, you've already said this once, uh, it's not going to be what it was before. Um, we're, all, we're always moving forward. And so what will, what will it be like in six months? And at Grace Cathedral, we're going to 
try to keep a lot of the people online. We've had a lot, huge engagement online from people all around the world. We're going to try to hold on to those people and provide something for those people at the same time that we open things up. So it's we're going to be committed to have, almost having two different audiences, the people who are actually in the building and the yeah. people who connect with us online. And I can imagine you're going to be, things are going to be just equal. It's going to be a tectonic shift for, for you too, in terms of you know how you do day-to-day -day business um, when we return to, to something that's a little bit more normal. Yes, and I think, you know, we also know that at the same time, societies actually tend to go back to normal. They, they want to go back to normal pretty fast. Yeah. And so what people saw as possible or necessary in a moment of a crisis, they can easily forget and, and lose hold of. So I, I hope, you know, faith institutions and philanthropy and, um, you know, all of us can kind of keep people, you know, we, we can be better. We can do better. Um, we have been figuring out how to do that in really hard times. So how do we hold on to that? You know, yeah. as begin to get better. Yeah, I, but I really can imagine, you know, when I'm retired and I'm living in a rural place, being able to connect to Grace Cathedral every day for morning prayer online and just how sustaining that'll be. So there is a way in which there's like a, a vision of something that could really, could yes. really help people. Yes, it's a very, it's very democratizing. I think that's been true for a lot of arts organizations, even performing arts organizations. You know, the Miami um, City Ballet did a beautiful thing. They they had their dancers do the Nutcracker outside in the community, and they, yeah. they sold the first sort of round of tickets to essential workers. They gave them to essential workers and their families. So all kinds of people who would have never seen that ballet um, were able to see it and access it. And I think that's that's part of what I think you're saying is, you know, they're, they're, we've learned a lot about how to democratize access to uh, being together. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really true. And I'm, I'm really grateful for it because I, I always did just growing up with like in the vicinity of Grace Cathedral, yeah, we live about 90 miles away from here. And, um, and so we couldn't, it's not like we could come every Sunday. It's not like we could really be connected to it. But now if you live 90 miles away from Grace Cathedral, you can be really connected to it. Mm -hmm. I yeah. wonder if you could talk um, a little bit about um, Episcopal Divinity School and just your experience there. I, um, I, I absolutely, like pretty much the worst thing that happened in my adult life, um, what, which didn't actually happen to me was, you know, Episcopal Divinity School basically stopping operations in Cambridge and moving um, to Union Seminary. I, I, I was heartbroken. I preached a sermon about it even. And <laughs> everybody afterwards felt like they had to give me like pastoral care because um, something <laughs> I loved so much was gone. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what you learned there and just kind of like what religious studies um, teaches you in terms of just being a productive person and, and, and doing ministry like the ministry that you're doing now. Oh, I learned so much there. I was there when it was still, um, you know, in Cambridge, uh, in Massachusetts. And I went there when I was 50. I went there after I had led an organization for, you know, 20, 25 years. And it was an organization that was focused on improving educational opportunity and work opportunity for low income young people and adults. And we had worked so hard always to take, you know, to establish the evidence base for make, you know, why uh, this was the right thing to do. And, you know, what EDS gave me was the chance to turn into values, you know, what people, um, what people believe can be possible and should be possible in a society. And, it had a very strong focus on liberation theology, as you know, and also a much more interpretive approach to religion, you know, that, that um, not a fundamentalist um, kind of approach. And for me, that was really, really valuable. I had a lot of issues about Christianity that I'd never taken the time to sort of work through for myself, and it, it gave me space to do that. And I went from there to my work in philanthropy. Not It wasn't my plan. Um, it just happened. Uh, it happened that way. But I think that there is a lot about philanthropy that's that is very, um, very spiritual work. You know, it is about aspirations. It is also about um, humility. You know, people in foundations have a, an enormous amount of power. And most of what they do is to say no uh, to other people's, you know, wonderful ideas and yeah. deep need. And that is a, um, I always try to um, think about that in a pastoral way uh, and understand what is on the other side of those kinds of requests. I feel like I have an obligation to do that. So I was very, very, um, just incredibly lucky to have time in that institution. And uh, it was a really special place. 
you know, one thing about it, um, Malcolm, I don't know if you ever took classes there, but they had a discipline that you had to do um, when you wrote every single paper or you um, read any text, you had to situate yourself first in relation to that text. You know, I had to think I am a white right. woman, you know, with a certain kind of um, background and I am reading this text, but it is, but it is through um, my life experience. And I, you know, I'd had great educational opportunities in my life before that, but I was always able to hide um, in my intellect. And I, I, I think that was another thing I would say was, um, you know, deeply, I, I took a lot from that. Yeah, I, I, th I think of EDS all the time and I'm so grateful for what I, so I was at Harvard Divinity School and cross-registered at EDS and then did, did doctoral work there too. So, so I was around EDS for a decade of my life and then my my grandparents, when I was a child, lived around the corner from EDS. So we, I walked by there every day when I was like five years old. Um, I, my grandparents would take care of me. We'd walk around EDS. Um, but the, the, those people, and you're right, that just that idea of just that of situating yourself every time, like, you know, I'm uh, I'm a, a, a white ordained dean of a cathedral, and and then just recognizing that before you interpret anything, like, because it's going to have a huge bearing on on how you see it. Um, I, I love that, uh, and I, I love that way of. I think if any if any of your professors were, are watching this and they 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 think um, that they would want to impart one thing, I bet that would be it. You know, I mean that that's what they would want to want to know that that we took away from this that education, which is just a huge huge gift to me, and, yeah. and it sounds like to you too. You know, and it, and obviously EDS does still exist, and you know I think. Uh, Dean Kelly Brown Douglas is doing amazing work um, with it at Union, and um, it 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 I I I think it will keep those principles and values as it goes forward. I hope so. Yeah, me too. Me too. You know, the other thing that you've been really involved in is education over time. Um, my daughter is kind of um, they have like a special track for, for education, um, and she just joined that track. And her. What she tells me about her education classes, it just blows my mind. I mean, I've been watching some of her lectures at home, um, you know, so it's, I've been really benefiting from her, huh. like, study of education. I wonder if you can talk about just about your study of education and just how education has changed over time um, throughout your career. Oh, we know so much more than we ever knew before about how people learn. It's astonishing how little we knew. Um, what I love know. the most is just the children, like that we just used to think of preschool as being daycare. We just, we had no idea that we're actually teaching children that, you know, I, I, um, that I just think early childhood education is for me, one of the most amazing things that we just didn't know that before. And now we're, we're starting to recognize it. Yes. Well, and understanding that, that the whole child learns, right? I mean, it's, and, and they bring their lives with them into the classroom. And I think that's, that's another thing that is a relatively promising um, trend in education now. You know, I think there's a lot of contested different theories about what we should most be paying attention to. You know, should it be standards and tests? Should it be, um, you know, a bigger focus on young people's development? But I think the promising thing is that once we now know that one size does not fit all, um, and that even the way we think about time and the flow, I mean, I think we, you know, we, we, uh, who says that, you know, you need to spend this, uh, you need to go through each year in a certain way um, and that you have a, you know, a four-year college. Well, why does it have to be four years? So I, I, you know, I think all through the life cycle, it should be possible for, for people to move through those structures with much, much more um, enrichment and sometimes more speed. Uh, so I think it's a, um, and there are all kinds of innovations happening, you know, both within the classroom and pedagogy but also, you know, in the structure of schooling, you know, early college high schools that let students, especially from low income families, start college level work while they're still in high school and graduate high school with college credits and degree and, you know, um, up to a two year degree. So I think there are all ki kinds of ways of being much more intentional about how to design systems that support young people's success um, and not just assume we leave it to chance. And I guess the other thing that I would say I, I really love is there's more attention than there used to be to transitions. You know, the time that, that often students are very at risk is when they make a transition, you know, from elementary to middle school, middle to high school, high school to college. And uh, 
I think systems are beginning to do a better job of talking to each other across those divides. And if they take the view that student success is really the thing they should be measuring themselves on, um, not whether students go on to the next thing, but whether they complete what they came there to do, um, you know, that's a pretty revolutionary shift. Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite things is that people, just having um, curricula that are based on what the children's interest is too. Mm -hmm. It's just um, so, so following, I mean, it takes a huge amount of effort to do that, but following a child's interest to, to, to shape the curriculum and instead of trying to shape the, fit, fit them into, you know, the, the a cookie cutter kind of um, experience of education. So, but one of the things that we have at Grace Cathedral, I, I, I should have told you this earlier, but we have a tradition of taking questions from people in the audience. And so um, it's a great thing. And, you know, we, we, we often get some amazing questions. So I'm starting to get text messages about what the questions are. Um, so here, here's, the, here's a question. Um, it says, can you tell us a story about a grant that the Ford Foundation made in 2020 for the first time based on the new world that has emerged and the inspiring story that you are telling tonight? So a story about a grant made in 2020 that um, yeah. just, um, you, you, you can share? Oh, so many. Um, I guess I would, I would talk about a cluster of grants um, we made. We, we, in the US, we um, formed something called a 2020 readiness group and we really tried hard to um, imagine what this year would require of our democracy. And we invested in things with groups of grantees that serve them all. So, um, we, they, they worked on um, a set of scenario planning and they actually, those scenarios actually forecast multiple different kinds of outcomes of the election, including exactly the ones that happened. And so a whole, you know, hundreds of nonprofit um, groups were um, not surprised, but prepared for when that happened mm -hmm. and were able to coalesce to really try to help make sure that the country moved forward um, in a in a very difficult time. Um, I, I'm, I'm so glad you said that. I, I had a friend um, who's a judge who was talking to me in, in September, August, just about legal cases that were likely to come up challenging the election. And it, I would think it was much less unsettling to me what happened between election day and and you know the inauguration day. It, it I was much less felt much less unsettled than I would have if I hadn't had that conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's I think that that's right. Um, so you know those those kinds of grants, uh, grant, many many grants to um, artists. Another grant is to a, a cluster of organizations that are um, trying to create a, a sort of archive of stories from people on the border, really capturing stories of this time um, as this country works its way through to a hopefully better place about how we're going to be um, on the topic of immigration uh, and making. Um, and we've also funded, you know, lots of really um, important work by artists, including um, a lot of support for artists um, with disabilities um, who are doing really beautiful, powerful um, work. So many, many uh, great stories in France. I'll keep thinking as we go. I might yeah, yeah, no, I love those examples are, are wonderful. It, it gives you a, a snapshot of just some of the things that you're thinking about. I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, that those uh, democracy project is just hugely important. Um, uh, here's, another, here's, another, here's another great uh, oh, yeah. grant. You know, we work, we have offices outside the U.S. as well, and we work on climate change and natural resources, but from the point of view of really trying to work with indigenous peoples to say that they are the first protectors, the first defenders of the environment for all of us. So we have worked with um, with indigenous peoples across Latin America and in other parts of the world, Indonesia and elsewhere. And when um, when Greta was here uh, at the UN, I guess this would have been in at the end of last year, 2019, but you may remember um, indigenous leaders were with her and those were Ford grantees. And um, they would have never been at those tables, you know, without those kinds of grants. Um, and their voices are so, so important for the kinds of issues that all of us are, you know, need to pay paying attention to. Yeah, I remember native Hawaiian elders talking about geothermal power in the 80s and um, just being just so moved by the, the power of their arguments and just the perspective that they came get, gave me on on you know what's at stake when we when we when we engage those kinds of technologies. I feel the same way just about the the um, 
you know, the, the, the Mauna Loa um, um, telescope projects in Hawaii too. It just, it's a chance for the whole world to just to, to stop and, 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 and think a little bit more carefully about what we're doing to the planet and what the future is gonna be if we keep on this trajectory. Yeah. Here's another question. So much about an organization, so much, so much about what an organization can accomplish is about the creativity and capability of its professional staff. Mm -hmm. What are the new things that your staff at the foundation is experiencing this year? And how can other organizations learn from your experience? Oh, this year, the COVID year, you know, I, I think we're all just trying to do the, the best we can. I mean, yeah. we as an institution have really made a lot of pivots. Um, you know, we, uh, what we are most, um, it's funny, we had probably our most productive year um, in my memory. One thing we did, which I haven't talked about, is we we doubled the amount of money that we were able to give out to our grantees by going to Wall Street and taking out a bond against our endowment. And so all of our program staff, while they were working from home, had to get twice the amount of money out the door um, in a good way to good get grantees. And we gave them um, a lot of trust and they um, more than uh, met that trust. Um, and, you know, Ford has been a place that has had no flexibility about work from home kinds of policies. And suddenly overnight, we were um, all, all remote all the time. So we've, we've learned lots of ways to try to strengthen our culture. We, we stop work on Fridays at two. We try not to have meetings then. Um, I'm sure as many of you do, we uh, have all kinds of ways in which we're, we're um, connecting people. But our, but our program staff have spent a lot more time connecting with their grantees. And that's really where they get their most powerful ideas is with the people in the fields that they support. And um, you know, they say that in a funny way, the power dynamics are a little bit different. Everybody is in their home with their children or their <laughs> um, and, uh And our grantees are not coming as supplicants to this big fancy building in New York, but we're kind of all in this together. And I think that that has actually been a powerful experience. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, um, I think um, I, same thing with the cathedral. Just we called everybody at Grace Cathedral within two weeks of the, of the stay at home order. Um, and there are ways in which this is an opportunity for us to be more connected to each other. Um, if we're if we're bold enough to seize that. And it, it's a lot, though. I, I, I definitely I think a lot about just how how overwhelming it is for everybody and just how we just have to be gentle with each other and yes. forgiving of mistakes, et cetera, because it's it's more than anybody could have ever imagined. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Here's a great question from somebody. They said, how have you changed this year? And <laughs> what is giving you hope? Oh, how have I, you know, I think how I've changed this year, I, I have always thought of myself um, as someone who thrived on stimulation. And I'm realizing that I really, um, I love having a life where I'm not on planes all the time. And I have some, greater ability to uh, to think and be reflective and deeper relationships actually with the people um, that I work with than when I um, sometimes am you know just driven uh, with all the stuff that we need to get done in the office. So I think I've, I've changed in becoming more reflective. I've become more reliant on my own um, spiritual practices to just get me through um, the days. Uh, and what gives me hope and gives me joy is the is the is the people that Ford gets to to fund um, and to support and to work with. You know, every day, I am just moved and blown away by their imagination and their courage, um, and their support for each other. And it really makes me hopeful for the world we have a chance to build. Yeah, I mean, in so many ways, we become less disconnected, and in other ways, we become more connected. It's. It's such a strange thing. Is there anything that you feel like you need to do more of before we go back to back to our offices? You know, I just was going back for a second, sorry, to the, um, the question before. You know, I think another thing that makes me feel hopeful in a way is that I think the veneer has come off. You know, I, I mean, the, the, the reckoning that our society is trying to do with its, its racial history. Um, we, we don't know well how to talk about race or racism or white supremacy. You know, we, we don't know how to call people into that conversation without making them feel ashamed. Um, and yet we have to do it. And I feel, um, I feel hopeful in the sense that, 
you really can't change something until it becomes real, until you're you're willing to admit that it's real. Um, and that makes me um, really hopeful in an ironic uh, kind of a way. One of my um, biggest disappointments this year was I was invited to um, be on a panel with um, some local artists for the International Leadership Association. The global meeting was in San Francisco and it was supposed to be in November. And yeah, we did everything online, but um, I, I really was looking forward to it and just terribly disappointed we couldn't do it. But I wonder um, if you can talk just a little bit about just what, what you've learned about leadership and what you know about leadership and what you have to share with about leadership with younger people. Yeah, I, I would say, um, I mean, a lot of the things, I, I, I think uh, when you're young, you don't trust yourself as much as you should trust yourself. Mm -hmm. So I, I would I would say pay attention to your ways of knowing and pay attention to the things you care about because that is really the clue to the things that will make you strong and effective um, as the unique leader that you can be. Uh, you know, I think for me, a lot of my my um, journey is has been unlearning things that I um, that. Uh, were important in my younger stages, especially as a woman and a young woman in my early jobs of responsibility. I had a, I needed to learn to be the first one to speak and to be assist, insistent um, about my points of view because they very often got ignored or picked up as someone else's ideas. And now I'm really learning that, um, especially to lift up young leaders and um, in, in the Ford Foundation and elsewhere, I need to not be the first one to speak. And I need to figure out, you know, how to pass the baton and how to make uh, space for them. And that is especially important with a lot of the young leaders of color that are coming up in Ford. And so unlearning some of the habits that I had learned um, and really being open to questioning whether they still serve the kind of leader I want to be well, um, I'd say is another lesson from this period of time. Yeah, that's great. So um, we're, we're, we're um, it's so late and you've been so great about staying up so late. Um, I, I think what, what we'll do is just, I'll ask you one more question then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, but I, I wonder if you can talk, I mean, as, as you talk about younger people, um, you know, what signs of hope are you seeing in, in them and, and, and how do you think they're gonna make things different uh, you know, in, the, in these next few years? Because I do see that the young leaders that we have in the church, for instance, Oh, they're, they're amazing. I mean, just, I, it makes me feel like the church is going to be in good hands in the future. And I wonder if you have a similar experience in the world of philanthropy. 100%. Uh, you know, I think institutions like yours and ours have to remake ourselves for, the, for, for them, or they will, they will pass us by. Yeah. Um, you know, I think they have a level of urgency. I think they do not believe that we can take in, incremental and small steps on the world's biggest problems like racism and climate change and, and others. And so I think it's gonna, I think those of us in big institutions are in for uh, in for a ride to figure out how to um, how to keep up with them and how to be uh, to give them real support for bringing about the kinds of changes they're trying to. Um, but I feel very, very hopeful in this situation. Yeah, I'm, there's so much to learn from them and I'm I'm like ready for it. I mean, it, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks and that may well be the case, but I'm definitely, as an old dog, ready for some new tricks. I'm, I'm ready to learn how to, you know, do better Zoom conferences and to do things on cat film and use social media and um, do different things in the liturgy and, and experience different kinds of music and worship. And so I'm, 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 I'm grateful for them and for what they, they have to teach us. But I'm so grateful for you. I mean, thank you so much for your, your, your important ministry at the Ford Foundation and, and for all the other things that you work on too. It's just your passion for, for these issues is um, so infectious. I think anybody who, who saw you tonight is gonna um, feel like they wanna make the world a better place as a result of seeing you tonight. And I'm, I'm really grateful that you stayed up so late for us. Uh, and I hope you can enjoy a little bit of the blizzard before, before you go to sleep. Oh, thank you, Malcolm. It was a gift to be with you. I, I really appreciate um, the time and the conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, please um, join me next week, just a few days before Chinese New Year, when my guest will be Chinatown community leader, Betty Louie. You can help us bring the art to life at Grace with a gift today to the forum. Please text to grace 76278 or visit gracecathedral.org dash give to grace. 
And again, thank you so much, Hillary. Um, and God bless you as you go out there and do your ministry in the world. And, and thanks for what you do at the, at the Ford Foundation. And to you. Thanks, Malcolm. Great. Good night, everyone.